So, about five months ago, I made a video outlining one of the worst races in the history of motorsport, that being the Formula 3 round at Monza in 2015. And I think it's fair to say that people kinda like that. Now, if you remember, I gave that video its title mainly down to the driving standards in that race, or lack of them. However, after watching the Music City Grand Prix on Sunday, I kind of think we have a new contender here. Hey there guys, I'm Will and welcome to FP1, and a very tired FP1, given that I was stuck watching this demolition derby till 2 in the morning last night. American Formula 1 fans, I finally feel your pain. Anyway, today, if you haven't figured it out already, I want to discuss the 2021 Music City Grand Prix, held in Nashville, Tennessee. If you didn't happen to watch this race the other night, Boy, you made the right decision. Don't you worry though, as now you've got me to break this show down for you. Before we do get into that, however, if this is your first time here and you end up enjoying the video, be sure to drop it a like and subscribe for content like this every single week. We're trying to hit 50,000 subscribers by the end of 2021, so if you've not clicked on that big red button yet, I'd really appreciate it. Anyway, I think it's time for a title card, don't you? <laughs> Big Machine Music City Grand Prix would be the first race held on the Nashville street circuit, a track that looks more suited to Formula E than an IndyCar race. And if you've been a fan of this channel for any length of time, then you'll know my opinions on Formula E line up alongside those on Adolf Hitler. My now impending Twitter cancellation aside, in short, this track was going to be tight. Like, stupidly tight. Coming into the weekend, people were worried about how easy it would be to overtake around the 2.17 mile circuit. However, in the end, we probably should have been more worried about cars making it round on their own. Practice sessions would be marred by constant breaks for red flags, as America's finest racing talent and Santino Ferrucci struggled to get their grips with the Nashville street circuit. Claren driver Patricio Award was the first one to plant his car in the barrier, after being one of a number of racers to complain about the circuit being so bumpy that it was difficult to even keep hold of the steering wheel. Not long after, Connor Daly would cause a second red flag, ending FP1 early but merely giving us a taster of what was to come. It would be rising star Colton Herter on top though, and if you haven't heard this guy's name before, well, I'll be making a video on it at some point. But for now, just think of him as IndyCar's Max Verstappen, but without the salty team boss. Herter would keep P1 in second practice, finishing half a second ahead of XF1 driver Alexander Rossi. The track had been ground down to reduce the bumps overnight, though this still caught out six-time IndyCar champion Scott Dixon who spun at turn 4, bringing out the third red flag of the weekend. The action would then quieten down for a little bit, actually allowing drivers to set some times. Though soon enough, Scott McLaughlin, Tokyo drifted it into the tyre barrier, bringing out red flag number 4. Racing resumed, but for hardly any time at all, as Rossi decided he wanted to test the strength of the Nashville barriers as well, leading to our fifth red of the weekend. With hardly any time being run under green, IndyCar would allow drivers to do one more lap to get their eyes in before qualifying. How did this go, you ask? Well, about as well as Valtteri Bottas' Hungarian Grand Prix. Pagano and Chiltern attempted a synchronised crashing routine before Dixon also spun off, but at least he kept it out of the barrier. <laughs> Never mind. Hey, maybe now the drivers have got their crashing out of their system, Quali could go without a hitch. Nah, who am I kidding? NASCAR ace Jimmy Johnson forgot that Indy cars are a little more delicate than what he was driving before planting it in the wall before setting a single lap time. And despite red flag number six, experienced drivers were making mistakes as well. Joseph Newgarden attempting Lewis Hamilton's tactic of driving on three wheels to very little success. Colton Herter was still on fire though, getting into the fast six with ease, as was Romain Grosjean, and for once, not in the literal sense. The final part of qualifying went without issue, with Herter securing pole in dominant style ahead of Dixon and O'Ward, leaving us with just the race left to go. And oh boy, if you thought things were bad as is, then you just wait for this one. Given all the drama throughout the weekend, no one really expected all 27 cars to make it around the first lap, and as you'd expect, they all managed it. This divine intervention only lasted a lap, however, as Dalton Kellett's car had a moment of foresight and decided to kill itself before everything kicked off properly. Much to its dismay, however, the IndyCar team managed to get it going again and allowed him to catch back up before the safety car came back into the pits. But the cars wouldn't make it to the green anyway, as Marcus Ericsson attempted a flying lesson off the back of Sebastian Bourdais. We would get going for a few laps until Ed Jones attempted an interesting take on a pass on Scott McLaughlin, pitching him backwards into the barrier. So after another period of the pace car, it was lap 20 and maybe we could just get this thing going. Penske cars power at each other in the wall. Pagano, Sato. Oh, for f**k's sake. Will Power would force his teammate Pagano into the wall, causing a traffic jam and the first red flag of the race, 
and the seventh overall of the weekend. We would eventually get going again, but Rena's VK would be next to put it in the wall, causing a flurry in the pits as any sense of strategy fell out of the window. And if things couldn't get any more crazy, a mysterious liquid ended up on the track in turn nine, extending the pace car period even further. Now I can't actually figure out why this was. Some were saying that the tire barrier was leaking, while others claimed people were pouring water onto the track from above. As you do, Herta would end up pitting from the lead, but with the pace car going so slowly, he actually managed to emerge in the top five and was allowed to get away with it, much to the frustration of Lucas Degrassi and the Audi Formula E team. Colton would then put on an overtaking masterclass, moving up to second and just behind Marcus Ericsson, who somehow was now in the lead, despite his Mark Webber impression on lap five. Slightly further back, Will Power was on a recovery drive after taking out one of his teammates in the pileup earlier on. However, decided he wasn't quite finished yet and spun off another one in McLaughlin to bring out yet another pace car. And you know, with Power doing such a good job at taking out rivals, I do wonder if he'll get a call from Toto Wolff in the next few days. Back to the action, and with the sun setting in Nashville, we were unsure if we'd even be able to finish the race before it went down. And so with two cars near the front, Andretti opted to keep Colton Herter out and pit teammate Alex Rossi, so to guarantee a win for the team. And oh, how badly this sentence is going to age later on. Almost straight away, Rossi was punted out of the running, after coming together with O'Ward on the restarts, bringing out caution number 3 million, or so, I don't know, look, I've lost count at this point. Next in the wall was Simon Pagano, as Roman Grosjean reverted back to his 2012 tactics of getting past people. And all the while, Herter was chasing down Ericsson for the lead of the race, until he forgot about having a brake pedal. The damage to the barrier brought out the 8th, and thankfully final red flag of the weekend, giving Ericsson just two more laps to defend from teammate Scott Dixon. And so somehow, despite turning his car into an aeroplane on the fifth lap, Marcus Ericsson would come home to win his second IndyCar Grand Prix in a race that was marred with incident and controversy. Now you'll remember at the start, I was comparing this event to the 2015 Formula 3 round at Monza. And though the incidents here were perhaps a little bit less dramatic than back then, I still stand by that comparison. The experience level in IndyCar is much higher than your typical junior formula race. And yet despite this, the drivers were repeatedly making stupid and quite frankly, rookie errors. Now I'm sure there'll be some people in the comments saying that I could do no better. And no, I probably couldn't. However, my job is to slag people off online, not drive a race car at 150 miles per hour. The track I think has got to come under some scrutiny too, being way too narrow in places and almost bumpier than most roads in Britain. And frankly, I'll be shocked if there aren't any significant changes made before the second race next season. However, the problem with the street track is that you're kind of limited as to where you can actually go. So I'll be interested to see where IndyCar decides to go from here. This for me though, still has to go down as one of the worst opening races, well, at least in terms of driving standards and track design that I've seen for a very long time. And on a more serious note, if things continue as they are, it's really just a matter of time before people could get hurt on a circuit like this. Anyway, that was my overview of the 2021 Music City Grand Prix, which I think is the first proper IndyCar video I've done on this channel. So if you enjoyed it and want to see more, then click on that subscribe button and let me know down in the comments. If you want to hear more from me, then you can drop me a follow as well over on Twitter and also join our Discord community, all links for which you can find down in the description below. But anyway, that's all from me for now. I'll see you soon with a brand new video, but until then, have a good one.